today, last class, uh, I had on the syllabus, I think it was called uh, globalization and political theory or something, something to that effect. And I guess since writing that, uh, I've changed the, the theme of this final lecture a bit. Uh, and I want to I talk about uh, defending politics or in defense uh, of politics. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that as kind of a wrap-up and uh, exhortation for this last class. Uh, in 1962, uh, an English political scientist and journalist uh, by the name of Bernard Crick uh, wrote a short uh, and very polemical and influential uh, little book called In Defense of Politics. And by politics, uh, Crick meant uh, a distinctive type of human activity where conflicts of interests uh, among groups uh, are adjudicated by discussion, persuasion, and debate uh, rather than by force or by fraud. A political society, uh, as Crick understood it, is one where individuals and groups played by certain agreed upon rules that will determine how conflicts of interests are to be decided. And Crick called this little book, very lively and still uh, definitely worth reading, uh, he called his book In Defense of Politics because he regarded the proper understanding of politics as being distorted uh, by certain current currents of thought uh, and practice in his own day, among which were, for example, the highly uh, ideological style of politics found, for example, in the Soviet Union uh, and its client state, uh, the kinds of nationalist politics emerging in the developing world, and even in some aspects of the conservative politics of contemporary Britain of his time, where uh, that meant a kind of unreflective deference to customs and tradition. I think today it's important to try to reprise uh, Crick's uh, plea for a defense of politics. Uh, although in a slightly different way. Politics, again, as Crick understood it, is something that takes place within a certain territorially defined unit called a state. Uh, this may seem almost too obvious to bear repre repeating. For centuries, uh, what is called the res publica has been regarded as the proper locus of the citizen's loyalty. And it was thought to be the task uh, of political philosophy or political science in its original sense to teach or to give reasons for the love of one's own country. Classical political philosophy regarded patriotism uh, as an ennobling sentiment. Uh, consider just a few of the following passage, passages that I had asked Justin to put on the board from Cicero, from Burke, from Machiavelli, from Rousseau, and from Lincoln, writers from the ancient and the modern world from many different countries and times all make important expressions, uh, some more extreme than others, like Machiavelli's, what, what, what else would one expect from an extremist like Machiavelli's, to, simple, to simpler and more dignified <laughs> statements like that of Burke or Lincoln. Uh, but anyway, all expressing the view that politics has something to do uh, with providing reasons for the love of country. Uh, today, however, uh, the idea of patriotism, uh, at least among philosophers, seems to have fallen upon hard times. Uh, this isn't to say uh, that patriotism as a phenomenon of, of political life uh, is likely to disappear. T to the contrary, uh, go drive uh, 20 miles or so outside of any urban area and one is likely to see uh, flags being waved, uh, bumper stickers on cars proclaiming the driver's love of country, uh, country music stations playing music that tells us to support our troops and keep driving our SUVs, uh, all signs of American patriotism to be sure. But, um, the, the, but the issue seems quite different in universities and in educated circles 
might say, where patriotism has come to appear to be a morally questionable phenomenon. Tell someone at any Ivy League university uh, that you are interested in patriotism and you will be treated as if you have just expressed a kind of interest in child pornography. Uh, raise the issue uh, and one is likely to hear very quickly repeated Samuel Johnson's famous barb that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Uh, or you might even hear, uh, if the person's read a little bit more, uh, E.M. Forster's famous statement that if he had to choose whether to betray his friend or his country, that he, Forster, wished he had the courage to betray his country. Forster, you know, the famous English novelist, authors, uh, authors of Howard's End and other important books, uh, Forster presents the choice between friendship over country, uh, of private over public goods, as a kind of tragic and even noble decision that one has to uh, make. But Forster, Forster, in some respect, has given us, I would suggest, a false dilemma. Uh, loyalty is a moral habit, uh, just as betrayal uh, is a moral vice. People who practice one uh, are less likely to indulge in the other. Consider the following example. Uh, a few years after Forster made his statement at Cambridge, I believe, three young Cambridge undergraduates in the 1930s uh, by the names of Kim Philby, uh, Donald McLean, and Guy Burgess. I don't know if those are names that are familiar to people here any longer, but they were very, very famous names at one point. Uh, they chose to betray their own country. That is to say, they acted for many years uh, as Soviet agents and for years passed on vital secrets, uh, English secrets to Moscow, as they all ascended up the ladder of British intelligence services until they were finally exposed in the 1950s. And it was not long after they were exposed and they had all fled uh, to Moscow uh, that they began to betray one another. Uh, loyalty, it seems, like betrayal, uh, is not a bus that one can simply get off at will. Rather, people who betray others in one area of life uh, are likely to do so as well in others. So Forster has given us uh, a false choice between choosing friendship over country or country over friendship. Uh, and as in most matters, I think it probably makes greater sense to examine the problem through the lenses of Aristotle who tells us everything we need to know about most questions. In the Nicomachean Ethic, Aristotle taught us that all virtues, that is to say all excellences of mind and heart, uh, are best understood as, means, uh, as a mean along a continuum of excess and deficiency. It is a matter of finding a balance, the proper balance between extremes. So it might be useful to regard patriotism in this light. If patriotism is a virtue, and I, say, I, I ask the question if it is, uh, it would be important to see it between, as a midpoint between two contending extremes, two contending vices. Uh, what are these vices, you might say, that obscure from us the meaning of the the proper meaning of the political uh, today. Uh, on one side, you could say, the excess of patriotism is a kind of nationalistic zeal that holds absolute attachment to one's country and one's way of life as unconditionally good. This is the kind of loyalty uh, expressed in sentiments like uh, my country, right or wrong, uh, but was given powerful expression, perhaps the most powerful expression, uh, in a short book, uh, another short book, uh, in, this in this case by a German legal philosopher of the early 20th century named Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt wrote a short book called The Concept of the Political uh, in 1921. And here Schmitt drew extensively on Hobbes, uh, but rather uh, to defend a view of the political. But rather than tying uh, the state of war, uh, Hobbes' state of war, to a pre-political state of nature, 
Schmidt saw war, and also which includes the preparation for war, as the inescapable condition of human life, uh, of political life. Man, he believed, is the dangerous animal because we can kill one another. And individuals, and more importantly, groups of individuals, stand to one another in a virtually continual state of conflict and war. Schmidt believed Hobbes was right in many import crucial respects, but where he fell down was in believing that the social contract could create a sovereign state that would put an end to war. Quite the contrary, he thought. The inescapable political fact is, therefore, the distinction between what he called friend and enemy, those who are with us and those who are against us. To misunderstand that distinction, distinction that goes all the way back to Polemarchus's view in The Republic, where he talks about justice being doing good to friends and harm to enemies, but might obviously go on much deeper or further than that. For Schmidt, that distinction was central to what he called the political. The political, he says, and he uses that word as a noun. Uh, we tend to think of political largely as in its adjectival form, but in Germany uh, you can often use it as a noun as well. The political, he wrote, is the most intense and extreme antagonism. Become, becomes that much more political the closer it approaches to the extreme point, that of the friend-enemy grouping, he says. Friend and enemy are the inescapable categories through which we experience what he calls the political. Life consists of that fundamental distinction. Athens and Sparta, Red Sox and Yankees, Harvard and Yale, these are fundamental groupings, enemies, friends and, uh, friends and enemies. All humanitarian appeals, he believed, appeals to the concept of human rights, to free trade, or so on, all of these are, as it were, attempts to avoid the fundamental fact of conflict uh, and the need for a politics of group solidarity. The politics of the future, he hoped, uh, would be determined by those who have the courage to recognize this fundamental distinction and to act upon it. At the other end, however, of the continuum of uh, excess and deficiency, uh, the defect, you might say, of patriotism uh, comes to light as a kind of, today, what we might call transpolitical cosmopolitanism. Present-day cosmopolitanism is to very large degree a product of another German philosopher uh, named Immanuel Kant, at, writing at the end of the 18th century. Kant stressed, on the other hand, that our moral duties and obligations respect no national or political or other kinds of parochial boundaries, whatever boundaries such as race, class, ethnicity, political loyalty, and the like. On this view, on Kant's view, that is, we owe no greater moral obligations to fellow citizens than to any other human beings on the face of the planet. Citizenship, if I can use language that is not exactly Kant's own, but is largely sort of identified with a kind of Kantian move in philosophy, citizenship is simply an arbitrary fact conferred on individuals through the accident of birth. But since birthright citizenship is an artifact of you, what you might call a pure sort of genetic lottery, there are no moral or special obligations attached to it. The Kantian emphasis on universality, that is to say that there is a moral law that, that can be universalized and held to be true for all human beings, 